Okay, so I will talk about um, affect. And affect really matters. So the learning process includes a range of positive and negative affective states. A student might be confused at realizing a misconception, and that confusion might turn into frustration. However, the frustration might be overcome um, once a student um, overcome the misconception, and then confusion might turn back into flow again and into enjoyment. So the whole learning process includes a range of these positive and negative affective states. While positive affective states contribute towards learning, negative affective states like frustration can inhibit learning. However, appropriate support can help students to overcome negative affective states. So in this talk, I will provide an overview um, of how we developed affect-aware support that was part of a learning platform that we developed in a European project called I Talk to Learn. The learning platform enables natural interaction through speech. And that speech is used to detect affective states. Um, then based on those um, affective states, we were able then to adapt feedback in order to enhance students' affective states and to move students from negative into positive affective states in order to enhance learning. <coughs> in order to identify how feedback could be adapted to affective states, we did run several Wizard of Oz studies. And can I just quickly ask you, how many of you have ever run Wizard of Oz studies? Or some, uh, not three. So I just quickly explain what that is. So a Wizard of Oz study is a user study where users, in our case children, are using a computer system. And that computer system in, um, um, behaves intelligently. However, the intelligence is not implemented yet. The intelligence comes from the wizards, in our case, researchers. So you can see here the children in front and the researchers at the back. And the children are um, interacting with the learning software and they receive feedback. And that feedback is generated by the wizards, by the researchers. They can see what the children are doing and they can listen to what they were saying. And um, this is quite an effective way of how you can identify if adaptation techniques would work before you actually implement them. And you can gather data. Um, in our Wizard of Oz studies, the children used an exploratory learning environment called Fractions Lab, where the children could um, explore fractions with different types of representations. And I give you now a live demo of it. So um, you can see here on the right, you can select different types of representations where you can generate fractions, like here the number line. So you can generate fractions like this, and then you can use the area. So the children were using this learning environment, and they have had to perform different tasks. And then they received feedback um, based on their performance and what they were saying. Yeah. Um, the wizards followed a particular script. So um, in order to make it more coherent, um, the wizards, uh, so we followed those scripts. And um, it shows, for example, when the student needed um, problem-solving support, then problem-solving support was provided. When the, st um, the students, um, when, it, uh, when the wizard thought the students would benefit from a reflecting, um, reflection, then a reflective prompt was provided. And of course, we were interested that the children were talking. So when they did not talk, we provided, for example, um, talk loud prompts. So these are examples of the different feedback types that were provided in the Wizard of Oz study. And we collected um, several different types of data. So we, record, we have screen recordings and video data. 
then we had student speech, and we had the feedback that was provided. Then afterwards, we annotated students' affective states based on this data. So we looked at the video and at the screen um, recordings and listened to the um, voice of what they said. And then we annotated students' affective state before and after the feedback was provided. So, and we followed there this um, method. So we had um, certain ways of how we classified enjoyment. So we looked there, for example, engagement with a learning task and looked at what they said. So if they said, for example, this is fun, then we classified it as enjoyment. So we had these for these different five um, affective states. We classified students' affective state before and after feedback was provided. And this data from the visit of OS studies helped us then to detect students' affect from the speech and from the interaction. So we, uh, the data that we um, was, um, discovered uh, from the visit of OS studies were keywords, then prosody cues like pauses and changes in intonation, and interaction patterns that could be associated with students' affective states. Additionally, we looked at the different feedback types um, that were provided to students and how effectively they could move students from negative affective states into positive affective states. So we found out, for example, when students are confused, instructive feedback is uh, very effective of mo moving students from confusion into flow. However, however, when students are frustrated, then um, reflective prompts or affect boosts are more effective actually than instructive feedback. So this is the data that we got from the Wizard of Oz studies about feedback types and we looked as well at um, how the feedback should be presented to the student, if it should have been high interruptive or low interruptive. So we discovered that when students are confused or frustrated, it's important to interrupt them however, and provide the feedback. However, when they are in flow, then it's better to provide low interruptive feedback to keep them in flow, for example. And they can decide when to retrieve the feedback or if they want to ignore it. So based on this data from the Wizard of Oz studies, we were then able to um, detect students' affect, as I said, based on keywords, on um, prosodic features like tone of the voice and speech pauses, as well as interaction, like if they followed the previous feedback or not. Then based on this, we started with our implementation of the um, adaptive support. So this is the architecture of the adaptive support. You can three, see three main layers. So we have the analysis layer at the bottom, then the reasoning layer in the middle, and the feedback layer on top. The input for the intelligent support um, is the interaction data from the learning environment fractions lab. The perceived task difficulty classifier, this is a classifier which uses um, speech, pauses, and uh, the tone of the voice to classify affect, as well as speech recognition software, which turns speech into words. And this was used the input for the intelligent support. And with this, oops, we were able to detect students' affect. Um, we used the Bayesian classifier for that to use this information to detect students' affective states. So we got a probability that a student, for example, was confused. This information was then used by the affective state reasoner, which calculates which type of feedback should be provided. So we had these different feedback types. We had, for example, reflective prompts. Then you could see problem solving support or instructive feedback or affect boosts. So this component decided which type of feedback should be presented to the student. And for this, we developed a Bayesian network, and that was trained with data from the Wizard of Oz studies. <laughs> so after it was clear then which type of feedback should be presented to the student in order to enhance their affective state, um, we then looked at how it should be presented to the student. And this was done by the affective state presentation model. So this 
model decided if the feedback should be provided in a low interruptive way or in a high interruptive way. And in the low interruptive way, um, it was presented in the light bulb. So you can see here in the middle and the top um, that the light bulb glows. This means that feedback is available. So the student could click on it and then retrieve the feedback or they can ignore it. And then we had the high interruptive way where the student was interrupted and the feedback was presented to them straight away in the pop-up window. And again for this we had a Bayesian network that was trained with data from the Wizard of Oz studies. In order to find out if and how this actually worked, um, we compared two groups. So we did run an evaluation where we had an affect condition with a non-affect condition. We had 77 students in total and the children which were using the system were between 8 and 10 years old. Um, so uh, the difference between the affect condition and the non-affect condition was in the type of feedback that was provided and how it was presented to them. So in the affect condition, while the students were working um, on the task, all the feedback uh, was presented to them, the feedback types, were based on their affective state. The message which was inside the feedback type was based on their performance, but the type was based on their affect. At the end, when they finished the task, an affirmation prompt occurred, and this was then based on their performance because they finished the task. In the non-affect condition, everything was based on their performance, so the affect was not included. As well, in the presentation of the feedback, while students were performing the task in the affect condition, this was based on their affect. Um, so, for example, when they were frustrated, they were uh, provided with the feedback message um, that interrupted them. Um, however, in contrast, in the non-affect condition, all this feedback was provided in the light bulb, in the non-interruptive way. Only at the end, when they finished the task, um, the affirmation prompt was given to them in a, a pop-up window so that they know, didn't know they finished the task. Otherwise, it was all in the light bulb in, in a non-interruptive way. During the evaluation, we annotated students' affective state with the heart mobile app and the prompt method with a subset of 48 students. Um, so what this is, you have a mobile app and um, you annotate students' affective states with a particular protocol. And so you look at the students' facial expressions and at their body posture, as well as um, what they were doing on the screen, how well they were performing the task. And based on this, you make a decision of what type of affective state the student is currently in. We looked as well at the task performance, so if they were, for example, on task or off task. And this was all annotated, and um, the mobile app um, heart was used to detect this affective state. It was then noted with a timestamp, and it took typically 10 seconds, and then you moved on to the next student. So you have a range of students where you move in, in a circle and constantly detect students' affective states with a timestamp, as well as their task behavior. And this you can link with the data that you collect um, with the system. So I'll show you now a quick video of um, how it worked. <coughs> so here a student <coughs> just received some feedback. And then he must have said, oh, it's really difficult and hard and interacted with the learning environment and had obviously problems with it. And then the affect boost popped up. So during the evaluation, 
Um, we collected from all 77 students the interactions data with the learning environment. So we did know what tasks were provided to them, what fractions they generated and changed, the representations that they've used, and which buttons they pressed. And from the intelligent support, we detected the automatic um, detection of their affective state, then the feedback type that was provided and the presentation of the feedback type, as well as all the probabilities that um, were calculated and the rules that were fired um, for the intelligent support. And then from a subset from these 48 students, we also have the annotations from their affective state and their task behavior using the hard mobile app and the prompt method. Of course, we were interested to explore how well our automatic detection actually worked. And we compared it with the hard um, data. And uh, if we look at all five different affective states, there was a moderate agreement between the automatic detection and the human detection of the affective states. If we exclude boredom and surprise, because they didn't occur very often, then we actually had a high and a good agreement between the automatic detection and the human annotation, which was quite nice. Then we looked at um, the feedback that was provided in the different groups. And you can see here a clear difference. So in the non-affect condition, um, mainly um, instructive feedback was provided. However, in the <coughs> affect condition, the feedback was more distributed um, between the different types. And this difference was as well significant. Looking at the presentation of the feedback, um, we could see that in both groups, uh, they are viewed similarly the types of feedback. However, there was a significant difference in ignoring feedback. So students in the non in the non affect condition ignored feedback more than students in the affect condition. They did not click on the light bulb, so they ignored it. Then looking at students' affective states, um, you can see here that in both conditions students were mainly in flow. However, there was a medium effect size um, um, in the difference in um, boredom. So students in the affect condition were less bored than students in the non-affect condition. Now looking at task behavior, there you can see that uh, in both conditions, students were mainly on task. However, there was a significant difference in off-task behavior. So students in the affect condition were significantly less of tasks than students in the non-affect condition. Um, now looking at learning gains, um, so we had a pre and a post test um, of their knowledge of fractions. So, uh, and you can see here that in um, both conditions, uh, students significantly <coughs> increased their knowledge of fractions before and after they used um, the system. However, the difference between the groups was not significant. But you can see there is a trend that in the affect condition, they gained higher knowledge. And we had a closer look at this. And um, uh, we looked at the pre-knowledge scores, which you can see here on the x-axis, and the post scores on the y-axis. And you can see here that the difference between the group was highest for students with low pre-knowledge, which was really interesting. So the, our key contributions are that we discovered novel interaction techniques based on students' affective states. So we were able to adapt the feedback type as well as the presentation of feedback. And we used the hard and the prompt method to evaluate the effectiveness of the adaptive support. So we linked the data that we gathered that the human annotated the, um, with the data from the system, which was really helpful. And of course, we, of course we, we gathered now a huge amount of data. And we are still further analyzing that. And so, for example, our next steps are to look at which interaction patterns are associated with particular affective states 
and what is the most effective way of moving students from negative into positive affective states. We are also retraining now our Bayesian networks and we are also interested in opening up the learner model, including as well the algorithm of the adaptation to students, to parents and to um, teachers. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. That's a very thorough piece of work. Um, so, questions. We, we all have to use the microphone because this is being broadcast. So are there any questions in the audience? Um, I wonder if you think that you may have got different results if instead of using um, the non-interruptive feedback in the non-effective control, um, you use the interruptive feedback with the pop-up. That is true, yes. So, um, well, we, we looked at this in the Wizard of Oz studies. And um, I mean, the students preferred when they were in flow, for example, the um, non-interruptive way, and they were mainly in flow. So I, I don't see that um, that would be because then in the in the affect condition, it was also displayed in the light one. Hi, Franz from Leiden University. Uh, I was actually wondering here. You give basically feedback. You try to get every negative emotion into a positive one, yes. right? So that includes frustration, confusion, boredom. Well, it depends what you if you define confusion as negative. But uh, frustration, yes. Okay. So boredom. did you actually define confusion as negative? Well, um, I I believe that uh, where we try to move students into flow. So, um, but uh, you, is it debatable if confusion is negative because uh, this might help to help overcome misconceptions and it can't be seen as a negative affective state? Yes, okay. That was but actually frustration is definitely negative. Yeah, that was indeed my point because confusion usually is taught to contribute to learning actually. Yes, I, I know. Yes, yeah. that's true. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a very interesting talk. I'm just wondering, and I came in a bit late, so forgive me, but are there some results as far as <coughs> how accurately you're able to predict these emotions? Oh, yes. So we compared them, um, the automatic one, with the human annotation, and there was a moderate agreement between all of the affective states and between the ones which were used often or which occurred often, there was a high agreement, yes. High agreement, okay. Thank you. Hi. Um, I, I'm not going to make to ask a question. I was going to make a comment regarding the first question about whether to use for the control group either the interruptive or the non-interruptive uh, prompts. Uh, from my experience, although I don't have the data handy right now, uh, something that happens with interruptive prompts is that students, especially young students, can get really frustrated. If, uh, and I understand that in this case, the design decision was uh, if we are going to have only one kind of support and there's not going to be any emotional support whatsoever, better to go safe and not frustrate the students rather than put prompts on their faces every now and then. Yes, correct. That, that was it, thank you. Thank you. So uh, this may be a thing that isn't so true with an 8 to 10 year old age group, I mean, but adults presented with something like the Microsoft Paperclip get very frustrated. So did you have feedback from the students about <coughs> their reactions to the interruptions? Yes, we did gather that and we are still analyzing that data, but it was positive. So they actually liked it, the feedback, and they liked um, the little robots which were included in the in the message and things like that. So that, yes, they liked it. It was positive. Okay, can we thank our speaker, please?